Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with one co-host this week. I'm Joe Lello. Apparently, Jeff is hanging out in Disneyland and uh, couldn't be bothered to join us. So, uh, we, But we have an awesome guest for you this week. You guys aren't even going to know that Jeff was on the rides. Our guest is Brian Meeks, uh, infamous maybe author or famous author of Mastering about- Amazon Ads. <laughs> I don't know, infamous, uh, you know, the, <laughs> I, guess, I guess it depends on maybe infamous to some people who really have aversion to math, but. Well, we, we like math here. We're sci-fi fantasy people. We, we geek it up. So uh, uh, I, I should point out too that uh, Brian f- publishes plenty of fiction, uh, several genres. You've done the thrillers and I know under your pen name, you've got some science fiction out there too. And that's why we yeah. let you on the show, of course. Yeah. And he also uh, runs a Facebook group on the Mastering Amazon ad stuff. And I think, what are you working on now? It's like a software for people? It, well, it's, it's an Excel tool. It's, oh, it's, it's taken over my life. I started <laughs> it coming up on almost six weeks ago, and I thought it would take two to three days. And that's, I've, had, I've taken a few days off in that six weeks, but mostly it's been 12 to 14 hours a day of writing VB code because in Excel you can – uh, do some programming, which makes it a bit more, well, a lot more powerful. And so I've been building this tool, and it's it's just really hard doing software because you think you've stress tested and everything, and then somebody finds a problem, and so it's kind of taken over my life. But hopefully, at the end of the day, it will be something that will allow people to who are maybe afraid of math to get the important numbers like read through description conversion rate and some of those things that not everybody necessarily knows how to calculate. And so I'm trying, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I, it isn't quite there yet, but yeah, that's what I've been working on. Yeah. It would definitely be nice if the Amazon reports, as you know, are, well, it can be hard to tell if you're actually coming out ahead or not. Well, yeah, the problem I I'm, guessing with the Amazon reports is that data analytics is not true data analytics. It's not really done by most companies. I was a data analyst at Geico where a 15 minute call could save you 15% on your auto insurance. You may not have heard that. And at the time I, I was part of a group that was started by a gentleman and it was the first auto insurance company to do data analytics in their marketing. I mean, it just, it, nobody had ever done it. They, the accountants would look at, ROI and that was it, but trying to figure out how to improve retention and things like that had never been done. And so I'm sure there are analysts at Geico or at Geico at Amazon, but I doubt there's a trained analyst involved in the design of the reporting. And I think that's why it's an issue. So sorry that was a long answer, but I do think that I think Amazon should call me and say, hey, can you come to town for a week and fix it? Because I could. They should definitely call you. And I guess we should start at the beginning a little bit and let people know that we're going to be asking you questions about Amazon ads tonight uh, or today, whenever they're listening, and uh, how we can use them, how to sell more books, hopefully. (laughs) So why don't you like tell us how you got into writing and publishing fiction and eventually tinkering with Amazon ads? Well, it started on January 2nd, 2010. I was bored and... At that point in my life, I hated writing with a white hot passion. I mean, I, I, I didn't like it at all. My eighth grade English teacher had beaten any possible joy I could get from writing out of me. And on that day though, the football game, the bowl game that I wanted to watch didn't start till that night. So I'm surfing around the World Wide web and I find this site called Blogger. Well, I had taken up the hobby of woodworking a few months earlier And the day before, I learned that the old adage, measure twice, cut once, which most people have heard, doesn't apply if you're measuring and watching college football. Because, well, I did measure the legs for my workbench, and then I did only cut them once. On January 2nd in the morning when I set them up, they were three different heights. So you have to measure and focus. And I thought that was funny. So I wrote a little blog post about my foibles in measuring while watching college football and they hit post and that was just that was it and I went on to this woodworking forum 
joined that after spending an hour reading about woodworking and there was a button that came up that said blog. Well, I had already blogged. So I went back and cut and pasted it into the woodworking blog, uh, forum called Lumberjocks. Next day I went back, 300 people had read my post. 25 people left comments along the lines, this is hilarious, I love it, you have to write more. And I did, I blogged every day from January 2nd, 2010 through uh, March 26th of 2016. Every single day, as part of my blog, I wrote a total of seven novels. And it just, that's where I got my start. I'd written four novels before I published the first one, the four novels of my Henry Wood Detective series. And so it was just, it just sort of accidentally happened. And in fact, the first chapter of the Henry Wood, which is actually technically chapter two now, I only intended to write one chapter of fiction. I, it was a blog post. I just thought it would be funny to, instead of writing it like a blog post, write it like the first chapter of a noir mystery. I named the main protagonist Henry Wood. It's a woodworking blog. And people then won chapter two. And so I just kept writing chapters. And before I knew it, I'd written four novels. And so that's how I got into uh, the business of writing. And then I branched off into satire and I wrote a science fiction series using the pen name of the guy in my satire series. And now I've written 12 novels. And then I've got the four nonfiction books, three of which I co-wrote with Honoré Quarter. And then the nonfiction about the basketball team that I mentioned. And I'm working on mastering Amazon descriptions now. So it's, it just changed my life. I, I accidentally became a writer. That's not bad for somebody who didn't like writing. I didn't like it, but it's amazing what external validation can do. People said, we, that's hilarious. We love it. Write more. And I was like, well, okay, I'll write more. So what happened when you decided to publish them on Amazon and the other sites, if you did the other sites? Uh, well, I, I have been wide twice. The first year of Henry Wood, at the time I was living below the poverty line. So I didn't have any money for editing. Uh, I had to save up for maybe seven months before I could afford the editor and for the first Henry Wood book. And it took me another year of saving up to get the other three books out, you know, save up for the editing and get them uh, published. And so the first year, I think I had 250 in sales. And then the next year was maybe two or 3,000, and then 5,000, 10,000. And then in, and then I discovered uh, Amazon ads and then went to 33,000 and then over six figures uh, the year after that. And so it was, it was the ability to analyze that I learned at Geico combined, because you know, honestly, my books are all 4.1 to 4.4 average, except for mastering Amazon ads. I mean, I, I'm, there's a lot of writers that are better writers to me, but there aren't that many that can actually do the analytics and uncover things like, how do you improve your, your conversion rate? Well, you use copywriting on your descriptions and that can make a huge difference. And if you're paying for every single click, 99% of the descriptions out there don't use copywriting. They just are a synopsis of the book. That's gonna convert at one in 30. Proper copywriting, one in eight to one in 10. And so even if you're not a fan of math, would you rather pay for 30 clicks to get a sale or a KU download? or pay for eight, you know, that's, that's the simple thing. And so that's combining my true skill set, which is analytics with then, uh, you know, Amazon ads is how I was able to you know, quit my day job. I don't even and remember. Move to Las Vegas. <laughs> and move to Las Vegas. I love it here. It's, it's a wonderful town. Um, we're going to ask you a couple questions about the coffee stuff, but I, I am curious. Sure, sure. Uh, I guess I should ask for those who haven't tried Amazon ads or tried them in flood quickly. Can you kind of give a little overview? You know, yeah. Everybody's seen them, I'm sure. But <laughs> Absolutely. There's two main types of ads. The type that people mostly use are the keyword ads. That's where you build up a list of keywords, a hundred to a thousand. And it's maybe... If you write thrillers, you might choose James Patterson as a keyword. You might choose his book titles as a keyword. You might choose the word thriller as a keyword. 
and you put these in a list, you run an ad and you bid on what well, I mean, you can bid on individual keywords, but to keep it simple, you can do a just sort of a, a bid across all your keywords. And then depending on the bid, that will, you know, you'll get a, you know, more impressions or less impressions. And then some of about one per thousand impressions, you'll get a click. And depending on your description, it'll take 30 clicks to get a conversion. And, and I, I use the word conversion. And this is important because if you're in KU, the number of, uh, of conversions that you're going to get, you're going to get more conversions that are KU downloads than you are sales. And far too many people, when they're starting out, they look at their clicks and they look at their sales only. And they say, oh, I'm doing horribly. And they just discount the conversions that are the KU and they ignore it. And honestly, there are some people that get three sales for every, for every 10 conversions. Three of them are sales. Seven of them are KU downloads. And so when people analyze the performance of their ads without including the KU downloads, they're leaving out 70% of the information. Which, which is no way to do analysis. And um, so I, I, I get, I, the point is, I, I'm getting a little too deep in the weeds there. You run these ads, you bid, and people click on them, and they buy or they download your book. That's it. There's also product display interest ads, which run on Kindle Unlimited, or run on Kindles, and there you pick interests, like Thriller, and you choose that, and then it will show up on the Kindle depending on your bid. So that's a, a very easy uh, view of how the ads work. But while it's easy to run an ad, it's far trickier to run them profitably and to manage them and you know, keep putting in new ads and all those things. So I hope that's a good 50,000 foot view. I did stray into the weeds a little bit, which that, that is my nature. I can't help myself at times, but basically it's a way to get in front of readers on the Amazon platform. Right. Okay. So it seems like, I mean, obviously we're going to talk a lot about data and how to interpret it, but it seems like the, the uh, there's sort of a sequence of numbers that you're going to be looking at and it starts with impressions and then from impressions to clicks and then, uh, you know, determining yeah. the clicks that turn into sales. But so let's start with the impressions. Um, if you're not getting a lot of impressions, what would prevent you from getting a lot of impressions? This is sorry there. Well, if, and again, most people prefer to do the sponsored product ads with sponsored product. It's probably your bid. It's too low. Now I, I don't, I don't know. Is this show live or does this air at some other time? Um, uh, I, this will go up later on tonight, but it's not live oh, okay. at the moment. Oh, no, no, that, that's all right. I just, I didn't, I've been on podcasts where, it's recorded, it doesn't go up for six or eight weeks. And that, that's actually important to my next comment. About three weeks ago, Amazon changed the platform and they changed what their suggested bid was and they added in a functionality called 50% increase. Here's the problem. Because most authors are not patient, they and when they're new, the easiest thing to do is just take the suggested bid, which currently is 75 cents per click, which is really expensive. There aren't many listeners out there who can bid 75 cents a click profitably. It just, it is not possible. So what has happened over these last three weeks is to get impressions, it has become vastly more expensive. But I've seen this before at other points in the last three years where Amazon has done something similar or made a change. And what typically happens is a lot of people who don't know what they're doing will rush in or, or maybe they just happen to pick this time to start Amazon ads. They will go for the easiest way into an ad, which is just follow the suggestions and they'll get crushed. Now 
they may not notice it because maybe they don't like doing analysis. Maybe they're spending $30, $50 a day and they're not paying attention to that, but their sales are going up. And so they're happy about that. And it isn't until 60 days later when they look, oh yes, I made $1,000 and I only spent $2,000. And then they'll panic and they'll stop all their ads and they'll quit and they'll never do it again. So what you have is this time right now where it's incredibly expensive. I myself am mostly on the sidelines. Um, in fact, I'm, I actually have killed all my ads. I, I'm down to, well, that's not true. I'm down to three ads, but I killed them all. I have, I have a client that I manage. We've, we've gone down from uh, just over 1,200 ads to down to 700 now. And so, so it's because I, I just won't run ads unprofitably and so I want I want your listeners to be aware that the next five weeks may be a time where if you're testing this out you don't see a lot of activity but patience will will win the day because the strategy that I, I try to tell people is when you're starting off with ads start with a low bid don't expect the ad to do anything just get your feet wet get it in there and you know what you might you might not get really many impressions at all, and that's okay. And let's say you bid 30 cents, and right now it might take 75. I understand that. But at some point in the future, it's going to come back. And so maybe you watch that ad for a week, and it, it does nothing. It's zero impressions. Then I would try one at 32 cents, and I would just keep climbing my way up. Now, it may take a long time, but at some point, the downward pressure is going to meet you and you're going to start to see some activity that's not what most people do and this is why so many people get crushed they take my advice at 30 cents it doesn't work after 12 minutes and so they edit their ad and change it to 900 dollars a click and then they lose their shirt because they're not patient you have to watch it again Panicking after 12 minutes is, is what is the norm, but I, I encourage your, your listeners to understand it's a long game because the hope is your listeners will take my advice, they will dab their toes in, knowing it's not going to be great, and over the next six months, they will get comfortable with Amazon ads, they will do things like fix their descriptions, and then six months from now, they're confident in Amazon ads, and they can use that skill for the rest of their lives, whether it's Amazon ads or any type of advertising, because the analysis and thought process is pretty much the same regardless of the platform. So uh, again, I got way off on a tangent there, but to answer your question, the next five weeks are going to be probably more expensive than people want to mess with. So I just want them to be aware. I, I hope that came through. No, yeah, that makes sense. And just continuing on from something you said in there, like after a week, you, you determine that you're not getting any impressions. It, like we know, like again, I've read your book and, and uh, ads don't always start getting impressions right away. And the uh, analytics don't really come in and become reliable for an amount of time. So like, yes. how do you know the difference between an ad that's just not good enough, like not bidding properly or not constructed correctly to get impressions versus one that just hasn't started like how long do you wait before you make your determination on sponsored product ads i generally give it a week on product display interest ads which admittedly most of my effort is in product display interest ads those i will start the ad and i i i just let it run i, I run them for 60 days and i just let it run for the entire time because Product display interest ads are vastly different in the way they behave versus sponsored product. Sponsored product is pretty linear. The higher bids do better than the lower bids. It's not that way with product display. I have many ads at 21 cents that outperform the ones at 25 cents, meaning when I say perform, I mean they get more impressions, they get more clicks, they cost less. The difference is in product display ads, if you bid 30 cents, they will turn on much more quickly, but you'll be paying 30 cents a click, which is important to understand. In keyword ads, you bid 75, you generally don't pay that, you might pay 52, but if you bid 30, you're gonna pay 29 or 30. I mean, you're, it's gonna be right there. Now, the 21 cent ads, 
those might be just stay at zero for four weeks and then they'll turn on. But at the end of the 60 days, both ads may have similar numbers. The difference is you know, you're paying like 45% more for the 30 cent ad than the 21 cent ad. And so I run a lot of ads at lower bids knowing that if I start the ad today, it's going to do nothing for four weeks. And, I, and, and I'm fine with that because I would rather pay the 21 cents. But I'm constantly putting ads into the, the funnel. So, you know, for, for the, the one client, I, it's a case of we've got a lot of ads that haven't started. But some of them are a week old. Some of them are two weeks old, three weeks old, and so forth. And it will always be that way so we can pay less, if that makes sense. So they do behave differently, which goes back to my point about it takes a while to understand that. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you next about the difference. You just described the difference with product display. And I think you said in the book, too, those are the ones that display on people's Kindles. Yes. Uh, and then the other ones, are they also the search results? Or, or is it just, like, what are you seeing on a book's page? Are those the sponsored ones? Yes, the ones that, the ads that are right below the also bots. Those are sponsored product ads. And then there's also ads that show up in the search. But I think the, the ones that people most often see that probably generate the most impressions are the ones below the also bots. Which brings me to a point, people wonder if they're getting charged, not charged, because you only get charged on click. If they are getting told that there's an impression when their ad is on page 22 because there's a carousel at the bottom and you can click it and go page two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. And it's not an impression until page 22 is on the screen. And that's important to understand because in almost every endeavor with regards to marketing and advertising, the mantra is always be above the fold, be on page one. That's just the way it is. If you're doing Google ads, you want to be in the top three. Here's the thing that is a little different about Amazon ads. Voracious readers, the, the ones in, in KU that read four novels, five novels every single week, and I think science fiction readers by and large are mass consumers of, of the products. You have to understand that they, when they do a search on a, a book, uh, let's say Ender's Game, if it's the same eight ads at the bottom of the page, and it's been those same authors bidding and getting those spots and bidding you know, a dollar a click, just ridiculous amounts so they can be on page one, those voracious readers have either already read all of those eight books or they've already decided that, you know, book seven just isn't of interest to me. And so if you're, that's one thing that you want to be cognizant of. When you're looking at other authors to pick your key words, look at the bottom. And are you seeing the same books over and over and over? Because if that's the case, the voracious reader is going to go to page two. Maybe page two is the best real estate. And maybe you're paying 30 cents, 40 cents less per click to be on page two. Now, so, so I just want people to understand that stressing out because you're not on page one isn't, isn't worth your time. Now, conversely, let's say you're writing a book on golf technique. Well, maybe there aren't that many people that are advertising books on golf technique and you can get on page one at 10 cents a click. Well, then if it was a choice of being on page one at 10 cents or page two at nine cents, well, you probably go to 13 cents and you land on that first spot because you want to dominate that niche. So it's not one size fits all, if that makes sense. It's good to hear that and good to know that if you're on page 17, you know, it's just, if you just look at how many impressions you're getting overall and not worry about, yes, I don't exactly see my right. ads. <laughs> that's exactly right. And if you're on 17 and you're not getting a lot of impressions, maybe you go up two cents. Is that enough to bump you up to page six? 
again, I don't know. And it would be different, you know, romance would be different than Westerns, it would be different than horror. And that's another reason why it takes so long to get a real feel for what these bids do to your ads. And again, for the next, I think, five weeks or so, it's probably going to be a little chaotic. But I am, I, I'm in my group and other groups, I'm seeing so many people that are like, oh, I followed the Amazon suggestions and I just got killed. And so people are starting to realize that just because Amazon says you should build, you know, a million dollars and your car per click, you don't have to do it. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm being a little... Right. And it's important for people to realize that the folks that are bidding a dollar a click are probably making 50000 a month, whether they do Amazon ads or not, so they can afford to lose 2000 a month that, or spend 2000 that's not necessarily breaking even or profitable for, the, for that spend. Well, th th there are certainly people that make a lot of money and do Amazon ads without thinking about the bid, but they probably also don't analyze their data. I had a woman I worked with for a period of time who was spending around $15,000 a month on Amazon ads. And she was making a lot of money. In 30 days, we reduced her cost per click by 24 cents per click, which is a massive amount. You know what? The next month she spent $15,000, but she got 40% more clicks for the exact same spend. And so she was just bidding whatever because it, she had a long series, her read through was great, she could do any insane thing she wanted and the, because of the read through it would be profitable. But you know, it, it, didn't take, you know, it didn't take that long to teach her how to, oh well, you know what, if I spend a little time, I could be vastly more profitable. And so uh, you're right, but the point there is that among your readers, if somebody listen or your, your listeners, if somebody has three books in their science fiction trilogy, then they are going to have to do things differently than the person with 10 because of read through. And so you have to be aware of those things, which when I see people ask the question, well, what do you bid? That to me is, is an awful question to ask because I can answer the question. I can answer the question for what I bid for my clients and you know, what I bid on my own thriller versus what I bid for my client are vastly different numbers because the client has lots of books and I have one thriller. So I have to make profit on the one thriller. The client can lose money on the thriller because read through is massive. And so asking the question, what do you bid? Is it helpful if you don't know their situation? And I, I hope people will understand that, that there's, there's just lots of nuance. Definitely. And uh, just because somebody's doing it doesn't mean <laughs> you have to do it the same way. That, that's an excellent point. And that, that's the most common people's thing that people say is, well, I do it like so-and-so, they're making a million dollars a year, so it must be right. No, that's, 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 a, that's a false assumption. A person making a million dollars a year, that's wonderful. They'll probably tell a pretty good story. Are they doing their descriptions correctly? Almost all of them that I look at, no. I have, I have six friends doing six figures every single month, and... They, they don't take my course. They don't run Amazon ads. They don't do any of that stuff. All of them have descriptions that are not optimized. They're leaving 200000 a month on the table. And so all of the people that are doing things like the successful authors are following descriptions that are a synopsis of the book, which the math says doesn't convert because that's what the, the rich people are doing. Well, the rich people, honestly, you know what? Most of them are, don't, don't need $100,000 a month. They're making more money than they'll ever spend, and they just don't care to optimize things because all they want to do is write books. And you know what? I, I don't try to change their habits because 
that's fine. If you're if you have a list out there that's making a hundred thousand dollars a month, they don't need to do any of this. They if they want to optimize things, they can make more, but it's not that important. They're probably happy doing things the way they are, and ultimately that's the goal. Very true. And uh, for those who are making a little less than that, I, I feel I should ask. You've mentioned liking the product display ads. Is that kind of an untapped, like not that many people are doing it? Uh, is that still where you're putting the most of your money? It is. It's, product display ads are hard. They're, they're harder to understand. They're harder to analyze because there isn't the linearness of the bid in that if I do a test of 10 ads on one book and have maybe five different bids, say two at each bid, across a range of 10 cents, I can do that test five times. And one time the top bid will be the most productive ads. Three times the top bid will come in like fifth or sixth. And one time maybe it'll come in second. But it's, it's understanding that ultimately one needs to focus on trying to get that low cost per click and just and not stressing too much about individual ads but getting more a 50,000 foot view of what is working right now in general what sort of range it takes combining that with an understanding of okay I want to scale how many ads can I put in to do that and so there, there's a lot more subtlety to the PDI ads to do them well than there are to the sponsored product. All right. Now we were talking earlier about how a lot of the ROI on on uh, AMS ads is uh, on uh, Kindle Unlimited, right? Yes. yes. Uh, obviously, you're not in Kindle Unlimited if you're wide. Is AMS sure. the sort of thing can still be of value to you even if you're wide? Yes, but one needs to understand that if you're wide, you you have to 100% have optimized descriptions. You, you can't make it at one in 30 wide. You should have optimized descriptions regardless, but you have to have the stuff done well. I ran a test, and I talk about this in my course, I think it's lecture three, where a friend of mine who's wide, he does very well, he writes science fiction, he does more per month on Apple than he does on Amazon. So he will always be wide. That's, for, well, I could talk for hours about how we got to that point. That's a different show. Uh, and it's his business, so I won't do that. But the point is, he's wide because that's the way he makes the most money. It's the best business decision. His first book is free. And so we did a test. I wanted to know could a book that was first book free, not in KU, could you bid a ridiculous amount and still make a profit if the series is long enough, and his is pretty long, and he has crazy read-through. I mean, read-through that's off the charts. And so we did the test. We bid a ridiculous amount, and I was, I mean, the analysis was actually probably some of the most challenging analysis I had to do because he started with getting an average of 25 free downloads a day. So we needed to figure out a baseline and know that the ads were generating above that baseline. And then we had to have a, an understanding of the revenue for all of the books in his series, what their baseline was. And the way I determined the, the ROI was the difference between the two. And well, I mean, it doesn't sound that hard, but I, I had to use a 21 day moving average and, at the end of the day, I proved that his profit came partway into book four. So after, I think it was maybe 45 days of waiting, it was clear that the, the stuff we had spent on these first book free, that at 45 days, people had read through to the point where it was in the black and he still had four more books after that. And so that was all profit. But it was an incredibly complex thing. And most people who have first book free have a read through from their free book from one to two in the bad is one to 2%. Excellent is 
like two to five percent read through. So if you have first book free and you're getting somewhere in the neighborhood of two to five percent of the people that are getting your book for free are going on to read the next one, that is extraordinary. His is 14 percent, which is statistically almost unbelievable, but I, I had mountains of data and, and all this historical data because we've been friends for a long time. And so I, I want the authors listening to take away from this that I wouldn't be able to do what we did on his books with somebody that's getting three, four, or 5% read through. It has to be an exceptional case to make that happen. So there are always scenarios where a person that's wide, if they have the right books, right read through, the right descriptions, can absolutely do it on Amazon ads, but it will be fewer than people that are exclusive. It's just easier. So makes a lot of sense. Um, I, actually, one of the other questions I was going to ask is whether or not you think this could work with a first book free, but that was the entire anecdote. So yeah, was... It, it, it was. And again, the first, if anybody out there has first book free, the thing I want you to figure out after the show is what is your read through? And, and if you get those numbers, if you're about 5%, then yes, give it a try. And if you're about 5% and you're in KU, then yeah, you have a pretty good chance. So the, uh, the uh, other question I have then is you touched a little bit on this too. Like a lot of determining whether like what your bids can be and all that is basically how much, uh, you know, how much money a click actually makes you and therefore how much you yes. can spend on a click. Uh, and if you have sales history and maybe it's high, maybe it's low, the, it seems like the lower your sales are on average, the more volatile they are day to day. Like you could have the variance. Say in the, 10 to next yes, that, that is absolutely true. And uh, it seems like that would make it very difficult to determine, at least early on, before you really start seeing results, how much of your day-to-day -day sales are actually attributed to the ad that you're running. So, yes, like, and, and this is where skill and analysis comes in because what I had to do for the example I gave was I looked at the, uh, I looked at, I think it was a, a maybe a 30-day, it was 21-day, a moving average. And so for those that don't know what a moving average is, and, and, and you know, science fiction readers probably do, but there may be somebody that doesn't. Imagine that you have two sales on day one, one on day two, and three on day three. That six sales divided by three days is an average of two. Now, if the on day, uh, on day four, you drop off the two that was on day one, but let's say you had... Um, five on day four. Now you've got five plus three plus one is nine and you still divide it by three. So your moving average went from two to three. The point is by doing a moving average, the variance that you brought up gets flattened out. And so depending on how much variance you have, some people could get the information with a 14 day moving average. Some people might need a 30-day moving average. And with a 30-day moving average, you need maybe 60 days worth of data because you don't even get to your first day until 30 days. And so by using that metric, you can get a solid feel for not only where your baseline is, but is it tilting up or down? And so maybe your baseline is at three, but 30 days ago, it was at four. And so whatever was helping with your organic 30 days ago is gone and you're trending down. And so you have to kind of be cognizant of it as you're doing your analysis. Because once you start these ads for the first book in free or for any, you know, any scenario, you should see it, the, the moving average should start to climb. If it's not climbing, well, then they're not working. And so that's how you can kind of distill out the, the new impact from the old. And just, I, again, your point about not many sales per day, the variance is good. Another thing to factor in is if you're somebody that has 50 sales a day, well, then you might not have as much variance. Maybe it goes 50, 45, 51, or what have you. You should still do that. But you're also, if you're starting ads, now maybe you drive your ranking up enough that you're getting benefit from the ads, but you're also getting benefit from organic. Now, you shouldn't 
worry about separating that out because I still believe that the fact that you ran the ads and got your ranking up to 500 overall, that, that credit should still go to the ads, but it, it's, it's a different thing to be aware of. That's why I have uh, a new release is I just don't even try to figure it out because there's so much different advertising I'm doing and, you know, out to the list Absolutely. and stuff, but I'm doing an older series. Now I uh, have a three book box set that's free. And the sales on the fourth book alone pay for the ad, the ad and the ad does really okay. well, but I find that with the free one, I can bid a lot less and get a lot more impressions. I, I'll say my copy's brilliant, but it's not. I think it's just that it's free and it's got a dragon on it. But, <laughs> Everybody loves a free dragon. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> but, and then everything after that is gravy because it's like there's an eight book series and a spinoff series. So it's, yeah. it's been worth it to keep that one running for me. That's excellent. I'm curious, I, I mentioned we wanted to ask you a little bit about copywriting because that is obviously, like you were saying, you want the ads to convert more and it's like maybe the ad copy on the ad is somewhat important, but it seems like even more important is the actual sales page blurb on the book. 100%. The ad copy, I, I don't know how many thousands of ads I've written. What, what, I want to uh, go off on a tangent here. People ask me if you, if, when, when the ad dies, you know, maybe it's run for two weeks and now it's not getting any impressions. And so they kill it. Should they use the copy button and run it again? No. Until you're making $10,000 a month, write new copy, do a new ad because you're not good enough at copywriting after writing three ads to start using that same copy. I've written thousands and I don't use the copy button. I always write new copy and it makes me a better copywriter. So, um, Sorry, I was reading my voice there. I, I just, I'm passionate about that. I want people to try to get good at the copywriting, but you're right. It is not as important in the ads. A lot of people just like a dragon on the cover, so they'll click. They may not even read the copy. And you have to understand that by the time they're done reading your description, if they read your description, they will have forgotten the copy that got them there. So it won't really impact the sales. That being said, in all the thousands of ads that I've written for myself or others, I've had one bit of ad copy, and I talked about it in the book, more snark than a snarkopotamus in snark town on a snarking spree. That was for my satire under Scotch and Rye. That ad for a period of five, six, seven weeks had 700 to 900% ROI. And during that time, all but one of my uh, reviews was five stars. I absolutely struck a nerve with the exact right reader that would appreciate my protagonist. I've never been able to duplicate it. I mean, I've tried, uh, but my point being is that during that time, I also had my best ever 10 days for that book. Two years after it was released, I had a 10 day span where it ranked between 520 and 980, most of the time closer to 520 to 980 for 10 straight days, all because of a bunch of ads all working at the same time. And so, you know, it's, you talked about launches. Launches are, are great and important, but at any point in your career, you can all of a sudden have something break out and see your ranking go up. And so, as far as, um, I, I've forgotten the question. What, what was I talking about? Were you listening to me? Because I wasn't listening. To <laughs> I think I was just asking you about the importance of good copy. Oh, oh, oh good copy, yes. Okay, Th thank you. I'm glad you were paying attention. Well done. <laughs> okay, so the point is, it's not as important as, as you might worry about for your ads, but you should still try to do it because if you nail it, it's, it's awesome. What's important is the copywriting on the description. If your listeners right now, if your description is a synopsis, people aren't going to read it. If the first line is more than six words, that's bad. The idea is when a person goes to Amazon or, and then they click on an ad that takes them to your book page, the way their eyes work is they, they scan from the top to the bottom, and there isn't much space above the fold to read more, so don't, so don't fill it up. They're going to click the read more button, have a, a few short lines that hook them. 
you want that opening hook, you want them to see it, hit the read more button because their eyes are gonna go from the top to the bottom. If it's short, it's gonna register what you wrote in those few lines. They'll open it up, they'll scan it. What they're looking for is really big fat paragraphs and if they see them, they can't be bothered to read your description so they click away. And I know that makes no sense considering they're shopping for a book where they're 100,000 words and they're gonna sit quietly in a room for three hours and just read giant paragraphs. That's not the way sales works. So if you've got these massive paragraphs, they're gonna scan top to bottom and go, oh God, I can't be bothered. It's just like, have you ever seen a post on Facebook where it was 30 lines uninterrupted? Do you read it? No. If you do proper copywriting, when I run a post on Facebook, before I started doing copywriting on the 20 books to 50K group, if I would do a post, because I, I tend to be snarky, so I would get some reads, maybe 50 likes, I now use proper copywriting, and some of my posts are 1,500 words long on a Facebook post, and they will get between 500 and 750 likes and as many as 400 comments on a 1500 word post on Facebook. And it's because I use proper copywriting. I write hooks, I use open loops, and people get sucked into my post and they'll read 1500 words, which is just unheard of because of the power of the copy. Now, the description's the same thing. You don't want it to be 1500 words, you want it to be you know, two, 300 words, but it needs to be formatted correctly. You need blank lines in between the paragraphs. It needs to be very light to view at just as a whole. And if you do all of those things, people will read to the end and you will convert better because you're not telling them the story. You need to, in the description, hint at what might happen. Don't tell them what will happen. You've got a dragon and Sir... Brian mixed codes a lot, met a dragon, and got eaten. No. Sir Brian mixed codes a lot, runs across a dragon. Will he be able to survive? Almost everybody has their description that's just a, a list of facts, things that are going to happen in the book. And when I get to the end, I'm like, oh, well, that was a great book. I don't need to buy it. You've already told me what's going to happen. There, there, there's no point in wasting my time because you gave me all the highlights. That's what a synopsis does, and, and don't do that. Can I, can I read my best description to you? Would, would, that, would that be? Go right ahead. I was actually going to quote your one about Firefly from the book. <laughs> like, do you love Firefly? And you're like, yeah, the answer, of course, has to be yes. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, that actually, yeah, I, I like that as well. But this is a description that is what I wrote this year. And it's different than any of my other descriptions. And it is my best, uh, it is my best description con conversion. Oh, I almost clicked on my own ad. I don't want to pay for the click. Okay, uh, let me get it here. And um, I don't know, am I able to share a screen and, and, and show people? Because the formatting is important. If I hit share screen, is that going to mess things up? Joe's our tech guy. What's say um, you, Joe? It should be fine. I mean, okay. if, it, if, if something goes wrong, then no one will find out about it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, let's, let's look at this. Look how little I have above the fold. But the first line is four words. Henry knew one thing. Dames were trouble. Would this client be the exception? Who's going to stop reading there? Nobody is. A, the word dames, and you can tell by the Art Deco cover, helps set the tone for the period. This is not a present day novel. Would this client be the exception? That's a hook. Nobody's gonna stop there. They're gonna click read more. Look at how light it is. My longest paragraph is two lines. There's very little weight here. She walked in, sat down, crossed her legs, and asked for a light. Boy, could she cross a leg. Before the woman had told him why she needed a detective, Henry wondered if she was playing him. It was something about her. The red lips and smoldering eyes were just a little too perfect. She knew how to get her way. And the dress? She wore your dress that would make an hourglass self-conscious. 
Was it the Damsel in Distress Act? This was the second one he'd seen this week. Something wasn't adding up. 1955 was going to be an interesting year. You'll love this noir mystery with a twist because everyone loves a broken detective trying to do what's right. Get it now. This description converts at one and eight. When I started studying copywriting, my description was horrible. It converted at one and 30. I wrote a description that was better copywriting, not this one. I got it down to one and 10. Going from one to 10 to one eight doesn't seem like that much, but you gotta understand, I've had 110 million impressions and over 600,000 clicks. So if you improve from 10 to eight, it's a huge deal on the volume of clicks you know, that, that you'll get with advertising. And so the, the, there's just, there's a lot of, well, another thing that's important about this description, at no point do I talk about the book. There's nothing in the description that says anything about what's going to happen in the book. If, if we go down to the, the okay, we, earlier you asked about where the sponsored product ads. Okay, here's the sponsored product ads. Okay. So this is the also bots, sponsored product, and I'm just gonna click on one at random and let's take a look. Um, look, at, look at what's above the fold. I'm not gonna read that, I can't even be bothered. How big are the paragraphs? Oh my God, no, I mean, look at that. It's war and peace. Nobody's <laughs> gonna read that. Now, I mean, this guy's a really good author and I'm sure his sales are pretty good, but his sales are pretty good despite the fact that he's driving away lots and lots of potential readers. And I, I mean, I don't need to throw him under the bus, but the, okay, how do I, how do I stop the sharing? Um, can, can you stop the sharing on your end, Joseph? Let's find out. Oh, stop sharing. There's a button. I found a button. <laughs> okay. D does that make sense though? The difference between a big, heavy, synopsis of story ruining versus something intriguing. Definitely. And it's funny because I think a lot of authors think the way I do when that click more button came on, I was like, why the heck is the book description the only thing on this page where I have to click more to read of? And I thought, I got to get as much as I can in those four lines. <laughs> no. And, uh, but yeah, I, I totally understand. And it makes a lot of sense that you're just trying to hook them to get them to click more. And then you're trying to hook them further and the more description to, click by the book exactly and then you get them down to the end but most people on those massive descriptions i mean our attention span has been destroyed by facebook we can't be bothered anymore and so we have fractions of a second to get them hooked but henry knew one thing that's four words i mean you almost can't not read it and then it's got the ellipses and then there's another ellipsis. so i'm, I'm doing it incorrectly but i don't care i want the sale and so Dames were trouble. What's that about? Would this client be the exception? I, I mean, it's just, it, it makes them click to read more and, 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 and it converts really well. So, you know, that's, that is sort of a big 50,000 foot view of copywriting. Now, is it easy? No, I, I work at it every day. I work at it by using proper copywriting when I'm on Facebook commenting on guinea pig pictures i still use co proper copywriting and i'm better at it today than i was a year ago a year ago i was better at it than i was eight months before that when i started uh well i guess a, two years i guess i've been at it for two years now so each year i get better because i do it all the time and that impacts i write better copy for my ads i have better description now actually believe it or not i haven't even optimized all my descriptions i don't my books, I don't, I don't advertise my books since I launched Mastering Amazon ads in order to sell them and make money. I use all of my books for research because, so like I will kill off all my ads, let them sit for 60 days, let everything die so that I can run a test and learn something new that will be more valuable. Because like I said, I have a couple clients, I'm not taking clients. So please don't ask, but I, I charge exorbitant fees. And so if I can do research and learn something that impacts, you know, the 1200 ads that I'm running for clients, that's more valuable to me. And that's, that's where I, I did the research on back matter. Everybody's doing back matter wrong. Everyone. I mean, 
they're all doing back matter wrong. I did some tests, and Henry, the book that I showed you, Henry Wood Detective Agency, for however long since it's been published, six, seven years, the read through from book one to book two has been 42%, plus or minus maybe 1% over an entire year. It's 60% now. I, I did research, I tested things with back matter, I looked at the way everybody was doing it, I did it, I, I did it differently. I actually, uh, the, sadly, recently, about a month ago, five weeks ago, somebody sent me a, a message, they had found a typo in Henry Wood Detective Agency, and so I got, I went in, I quickly changed it and uploaded it what I didn't realize is that I'd uploaded an older version of, of uh, what's the, what is the Scrivener? And so it, ha it didn't have my most current back matter. It had like the second or third iteration as I was doing these tests. And so my back matter is actually wrong in Henry Wood Detective Agency now. But I found this out yesterday. I'll fix it this weekend. And uh, the point being though is that back matter matters and so i'm constantly doing research on ways to just optimize things because like i said at the beginning of the show i am not an author who's going to write fiction that is 4.6 to 4.8 average over 400 reviews i'm just not as good as those authors but i tell you, i'm good enough that i can uh, you know, write good books and so you know i want to optimize that and it's uh, someday when i've done all the research i want to do i'll go back to selling my books but um, anyway, I, again, I got off tangent. I'm sorry about that. I've, I've answered so few questions in an hour. I just get excited and start running amok. No, that's okay. And I wanted to emphasize for those uh, listening that what you were saying about, you don't have to summarize everything. You don't have to write the whole world building because fantasy and sci-fi authors were the worst. We made up this whole world and we want it in the description and I actually took a... Don't, don't, like, tell, don't tell any of it. I mean, I, I, right. I, honestly, I, I wouldn't... We're writers. And, and, and copywriting is an art. But, you know, just... just you, know, you write scenes in the book and you, you end chapters on cliffhangers and you, you build up expectation of, you know, is this person going to survive? You do that for 100,000 words. You're, you're good at this. So do it for 300 in the description just to get them into starting the series and then let the book carry it from there. With, with box sets, I tend to believe that the, the description that's used for book one should probably be with a few minor alterations, the description used for the box set because you're just trying to get them into book one. That one we clicked on, it had a description for every single one of the books. I don't think that's as efficient and the data shows it's not as efficient. So, yeah, I've actually had good luck doing almost completely different descriptions for uh, the box sets to try to hit a different audience. They might still be the readers of the book, but it's like maybe if it's more romance, fantasy oriented versus book one was more action or, you know, uh, I've just had good luck with that. Well, and, and you, you mentioned in, in my book, I talked about the test I did for my science fiction series where I was doing Facebook ads and I mean that Facebook ads driving people to landing pages. And because I wanted to do research, I created eight different identical landing pages. When I ran the Facebook ads, because you can pick gender and age, I grouped, I ran eight identical ads, except that in one ad, it would only be shown to women 18 to 27, men 18 to 27. And so I broke out four different age ranges and then male and female. So if they clicked on my ad and they took the free giveaway, then not only did I have their email address, I had their gender and age range, which the idea was if I built a list that way, I would have more detailed information to do lookalikes for Facebook ads down the road. But what I ended up discovering was the copy mattered. The first copy I did on the ad was generic. And the landing pages were all identical copy, and it was generic. It converted at one and nine. Keeping in mind, I'm trying to give away a free book one. Every, one in every nine people, male or female, 
took advantage of the author of the offer. I then changed the copy up and wrote better copy. I got it down to one in seven. Next, I decided I'm going to write gender specific copy because in the one sense, there, there's a very strong female uh, co-protagonist, if you will. And so I focused on her and the copy was something along the lines of Fristian Nash thinks he's the hero. Sasha thinks it's adorable. She'll do her best to keep him alive. Something like that. It was very much female centric and I showed those to the women that were clicking on the ads. One, down to one in three with gender specific. On three of the four males, I wrote ones talking that were Nash centered. You know, the very manly copy. Down to one in 3.5. Not quite as good as the one in three. I think it was funnier copy, but one in 3.5. There was one page of the men's where I took the female centric copy and put it on the page. And I, I need both you to guess. Now, well, you may have read it in the book, but uh, if, 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 you, if you already know the answer, don't play. Uh, out of 62 clicks, males, female centric ad, how many conversions? Joseph, do you have a guess? Out of 62. 25. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, do you know the answer? I read, knows, it in the book. <laughs> read it in the book. Zero. Zero. There wasn't a single male science fiction reader out of those 62 that would read a book with female-centric copy. If you think copywriting doesn't matter, you're wrong. And so for those readers out there that understand your audience, I mean, you, you can go through your, if you've got 400 reviews, go through them. A lot of times you can, you can tell the gender of the person that left the review by, by their, their handle. And so I would go through all 400 and I would either say male, female, or unknown if you, if you can't tell from the handle and get a breakout of your readership. If your readership is 80% female, then maybe you want to write female centric copy. If it's, you know, if it's 40% uh, male, well, I mean, I think women, and this is a generalization, I haven't tested this, but I think women are used to the world having male-centric copy, so I don't expect that if I used the male-centric copy on the female, it would have been as bad. It wouldn't have been as good as one in three, but it might have been one in five. Um, but if you have a big chunk that are male readers, then you, you may want to stick with the male-centric because the women will be like, yeah, we know, you're all sexist, that's fine, we'll, we'll read it anyway. Whereas the guys just simply won't read it. I mean, again, 62 is not statistically significant, but the fact that I was getting one in, one in nine with my worst copy, and then to go zero for 62 is just staggering. And so understanding that can make you better at planning out how you're doing your, your descriptions. All right. So. Um this is going to be my last question, I think. Okay. Um, let's say that um, you've been, you know, you've bought your book and you've gotten pretty good at making ads and, and you've been sort of sneaking up to the profitable level from the lower bids and all that. Sure, and sure. You, you've gotten pretty consistent at being able to turn 20 bucks into 80 bucks or something like that. Um, 80 bucks is still not quit your job money. So, no. like, how do you scale ads? Like, how do you scale your, your, your improvement in sales over time? Sc scaling ads is hard. It takes, if, if you've got, it, it's about volume of ads. And if you've got 800 keywords on a list, you can run one ad. Maybe you need to spend time building out a keyword list to 5,000 so you can run 5,000 word ads. At this point, I do want to talk about something that is a plague on AMS ads, and it's that authors want to analyze their keywords. They feel like if they're being proactive and going through their keywords and analyzing them, that they will have a better list and it will better perform, and they spend hours and hours and hours doing this. You can't analyze keywords. You don't get enough clicks across the keywords to have statistic, statistically significant data. We talked about variance. 
if your ad is converting at one in 30, what are the chances? I did a simulation with a thousand simulated conversions using Excel, and I put in a conversion rate of one in 30. And then I just let it run. And, it, and each time it, it would look at it and it would decide, okay, 3.3% chance of converting. And then it would go to the next one. And then I could look at, it was either a one for a conversion or a zero. And I would then count up the numbers between the conversions. So this is a one in 30 conversion simulation. It converted the first time on click eight. Then it uh, converted the second time on 32. And I don't remember the third or fourth, but the fifth time it converted, it took 149 clicks. And that's what you have to understand is that even with a one in 10, when I did the simulation, there was a span where it took 49 clicks on a one in 10 converting description to convert because of the way variance works. Unless you have a thousand clicks on a keyword, you don't, on a single keyword, not across your ad. Most ads don't get a thousand clicks. I think I know of one ad for one person ever that has had a single keyword that's had a thousand clicks on one of the keywords. And that's out of the hundreds and hundreds of authors where I've looked at their data. So you, 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 can't, you can't analyze keywords, don't spend time on it. You know, that's, that's just a horrible waste. And so uh, you know, that wasn't really your question, but I do think that's if somebody's new out there, they're gonna try to do that. And they're gonna see an ad that goes zero for 30 clicks. Well, first off, the AMS reporting doesn't show you if there's KU downloads. So you just turned off a keyword that had 30 clicks and maybe it had four KU downloads. So it was your best keyword of all of your keywords and you just killed it because it says zero for 30. It wasn't statistically significant and 70% of your conversions are never gonna be on the report. So, so don't do it, that, that's my point there, sorry. <laughs> It does seem like to scale, uh, like Joe was saying, and you were mentioning before that somebody had 1,200 ads running, that you really have to, and you mentioned this in the book, you have to put a lot of hours into like constantly yeah. making new ads because they kind of peter out after a they very do. short time. Yeah, sponsored product ad can run for five or six days where you're getting, like if you ran an ad and you let it run for 90 days, 90% of the impressions will be in a five or six day span. And so it's important to, you know, you can let that ad trickle along doing next to nothing, but you're probably better off terminating it and going with a new ad. And so it does take volume. And I know how authors are. There are people that are listening that are going to go out. They're going to use the copy button. They're going to make volumes of ads because they think I just suggested that was the easy button. No, I, you know, again, do I have a client that has 1200 ads or are you now it's down to 700? Yes, I do but I'm really good at analyzing them. And here's the thing, if you're new to this, you, 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 you don't know what to look at. Like I, I'm able to analyze things differently than most people because of my experience. I, there's so many bits of knowledge that I can know that I can look at and determine how a group of ads is doing. And I don't analyze individual ads. I don't care how one ad does, which is a, another mistake people make. I look at collections of ads for a book and I'm able to handle that sort of volume because of my experience level. Somebody that's new, you just have to understand. I think chapter five in the book, I taught, talk about setting expectations. It takes a while. In six months when you've been doing this and you're getting to the point that Joseph mentioned with, you know, now you're starting to do 80, you're making $80 on a $20 spend, then yes, if you were doing, if you've got 10 live ads, try to get it to 30 or 40, but don't go straight to a thousand. You know, you're going to build by scaling. If you had 500, 800 keywords, spend a day, you know, build up to 5,000 using a tool. You know, there's, there's tools out there. KDP Rocket by Dave Chesson is what I use. And get those 5,000. And now if you were running one ad that was sponsored product and nine that were product display, you can now run maybe five ads that are sponsored product and maybe 20 or 30 that are product display. And that's how you will start to scale up. But your goal is to go from 80 to 160, not to 5,000 right away. 
And so I hope that answers your question, Joseph. Um, it's, it's a process and it just, it will take more work once you sort of have it figured out. All right. And my last question kind of on this is going to be because somebody asked me when I launched my last book, you know, like what, how many Amazon ads are you running to get 150 overall in the store? And obviously that was my newsletter and stuff. Is it actually possible? Cause I've kind of found it's hard as you get higher in the ranking, it's hard to move the dial enough to keep you up there just from the ads. Oh, uh, are you seeing people that are able to stay in maybe the top thousand consistently month to month from using ads? It's, it, it is really hard. I think most of the people that, that no, it, it is, it is really hard to just do one thing. I would say the people that are in that you know, top thousand, top 500 or whatever are doing ads. That's a portion of their, of, of, of their, their conversions. Absolutely. But they're probably maybe doing Facebook ads as well. And they've spent the years it takes to get good at those. And that's a portion of them. And they may have a rep, you know, they're, they're maybe getting merchandising from Amazon. And so, you know, that's driving another big chunk of, of their volume or maybe they just have a rabid fan base and they have 10,000, 20,000 people on their list and they're, you know, they're, they're using that list strategically and they're, they're not just blasting all 20,000 on day one. They're spreading it out to try to elevate and keep things. So at that level, people, it's a more complex issue and it's harder when you, when you're, you know, when you're doing $25,000, uh, a month in sales, it, it takes doing a lot of different things. And they're, they're probably you know, maybe running book club ads as well. There's a lot of components. And so um, I wouldn't say that it, it is possible that somebody is only doing Amazon ads, but they may even be getting support from Amazon that they don't know about. I mean, they don't necessarily have to have a rep for Amazon to say, you know, we're going to juice this book because we feel it's doing well. And so they may think that it's just their ads, but something behind the scenes. The top thousand is just hard. That's the bottom line. All right. But, and so we don't end on a discouraging note well, to remind yeah. folks, you went from not selling many books at all to really moving the dial with ads. So it's possible certainly to. Uh, yeah, I, I, I generated over $200,000 in net revenue on $45,000 in ads in the first, uh, you know, that's up, up to the point that I launched uh, the book. I think it was you know, 40,000 and 202,000. So, you know, 300% or that'd be, uh, two, yeah, 300% return on investment. Now, again, you have to understand that I also, for a period of time, nobody was doing Amazon ads. I was getting clicks at five cents. And so, you know, it, it is more challenging now. It's harder. It takes more work, but um, it can still absolutely be done. So I didn't mean it to be discouraging, but honestly, you know, you, you can, you can make 10, 15, $20,000 a month in profit with Amazon ads and still not have your book in the top thousand. I mean, it, it, it absolutely, my best month ever as far as ranking or ranking was when Underwood Scotch and Rye, you know, I had that 10 day span. That was my best month wherever I had ranking. It was not my most profitable month. My most profitable month, I don't think I cracked the top thousand on any of my books. And I had 17,000 in, in net profit. And so, yeah, we love ranking, but it's, I mean, ultimately it's the dollars that are left over at the end of the day. That's a good point not to get hung up on that. I mean, I have lots of stuff that's, you know, like 50,000 in the store and still make a good income because I have so many books out. Exactly. Um, but thank you so much for spending this time with us today, Brian. Do you want to plug your book or, or anything you're working oh, on? That we can I, mean, people to? I, don't, I don't know. It's, you know, that they, they can find me. I'm out there. I, I don't need to, uh, nah, yeah, we don't need to. <laughs> it's not All right. Part. Well, at least if people, people can pick find me. They, they'll, they'll figure out where I am. All right. Well, they can pick up Mastering Amazon ads for sure. And what's the name of your pen name that you write the sci-fi oh, under? Uh, it's Arthur Byrne, B-Y-R-N-E. It's called the Magellan Apocalypse. And it's okay science fiction. I mean, it's, it's, 
you know, it, it's, it's fair. It, it's, it's a fair book. I like the series. I wrote, you know, the old adage about if there's a book that you want to read that hasn't written, write it. I wrote the book I wanted to read. And so I really, really like it. It's, it's delightful, but it, it's, it's kind of snarky. And it's uh, one of the complaints I get is I don't really describe the aliens. Well, you know, when I'm reading science fiction, I don't care that much about the aliens. So I didn't describe them. That was a mistake. So you know what? For most people out there, it's probably just an okay book but it was the book I wanted to read. And so I wrote it for myself. So, and oh, Arthur Byrne is, is my protagonist in Underwood, Scotch and Rye. He actually writes the first book in the satire. And so when I finished the satire, um, the, the second book in the series where he writes the Magellan Apocalypse, I had actually finished the, the, the trilogy before I finished the book that references my, my character writing the series. And so that's, I use that to tie in. And I get a lot of people that don't read science fiction. Um, the non-science fiction readers like it better than the science fiction readers. So it's, 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 not, it's not great. I'm just saying. All um, right. Well, I will include it in the show notes. Worst, just in case anybody wants to read Brian's just okay book. promo ever. Eh, it's not that great. I wouldn't bother. But I okay, trust I, the I, ad I, copy <laughs> is a little more the, the, <laughs> enticing. The, the, ad, the ad copy is better than that. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. And I will include uh, the link to the Facebook group and your books in the show notes for episode 198. We're getting up there at marketingsff.com. If y'all are listening on the treadmill or something and uh, <laughs> can't get in there right now. And thank you so much, Brian, for your time. Can, can I ask one question? Could, could I send you a link to my course? And Absolutely. Like, uh, I have a, I can make a code um, for your course and give people like 30% off if there was anybody that was interested in taking even further so maybe i could do that after the show and give that to you definitely we will put that in there too okay thank you so much i appreciate it thanks for having me on this was fun all right, all right. thank you so long everybody